Welcome to Giant Radio, where we're all about big ideas in sales and marketing and eye-popping discussions with successful entrepreneurs. Turn up the volume and settle in. Now, here's the founder of Giant Jacks Media and your host, Paul Hitchcock. Hi, everybody. This is Paul Hitchcock. Welcome to Giant TV. I am the founder and president of Giant Jacks Media. We help other solopreneurs and businesses to grow and nurture with identifiable and repeatable processes. Really fired up for my guests today, uh, Tane and Ross. Tane Minnick is an incredible Vistage chair in California, doing amazing things. Ross is the founder and uh, of King, King. Am I saying this right? Kingo AI, Ross. Kingo, exactly. Kingo AI, okay, and which is all about custom software, consulting services, and really setting up companies with their AI brains. Is that yeah. what everything say? Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. we're gonna learn all about that. Uh, so, Tony, I want to start with you because we're talking here about obviously AI and everybody's focused on this. I know certainly Vistage, you know, your organization is all over this and chat GPT. So, uh, Tony, what is going on with you, your members when it comes to uh, AI? Yeah, great question. And and uh, we we actually invited Ross last last month or the month before. It is last month actually. Ross came to our group and we had such a dynamic conversation. It was really um it was a fun conversation and everybody got to kind of pitch in and learn a little bit about where, you know, what it is and and how it's how it's impacting the world, them. I think some people came to the group, some of these leaders came to the group and they're like, oh, you know, it's just another tech thing. And I think they left going, oh, I got to I got to figure out how this applies to me. Because you're working with business owners, right? Uh, Large, larger companies, middle market and bigger. Yeah, my I mean, the range of 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 the leaders at my table ranged from, you know, 10 to well, probably 20 employees to over 500 employees. Right. There are some owners, there's some corporate leaders at, at the table. So it's a very diverse group of people. And we have two startups at the table as well. So it, it makes for a really rich, robust conversation. And each one of them have a different relationship with AI and a different level of knowledge with AI. And so what was great having Ross there was we we he hosted this very dynamic conversation. And I think the other thing that happened was they started to think about their own customers. Like it, it isn't just about you and your company, but how are your stakeholders, your customers, your suppliers, how are they embracing AI? Mm-hmm. And that was also a big awareness for a lot of the people at the table. Well, what what uh, areas are they specifically looking at or asking questions about with AI, Tane, with these business owners? Uh, is it like, yeah, what exactly are they wanting to understand what AI might be able to do with them? And I know Ross is going to chime in here, too. Yeah. And, and, and I'll let Ross kind of maybe take over a little bit at this point. I'll just say one thing, and that is none of my CEOs right now are in the tech industry. So th- this is really new for this for my group specifically. There are some groups that have maybe more, you know, tech leaders at their at their Vistage group. We don't. So it was it was a little. It was just sort of like, what is it, right, Ross? Yeah, we, oh, right? absolutely. I mean, it. I do love seeing when kind of the light bulb clicks and people are like, "Wow, this could actually help us. <laughs> this could help us on a day to day basis." And I mean, for anyone who's who may not be familiar, whether you've you've used ChatGPT or something, it's kind of like a digital assistant. Uh, it can read, write, analyze, can help us problem solve, brainstorm. And so, I think one of the reasons why AI is taking off so much now is because it's an intuitive interface. It's a chat interface. It's just like speaking with someone. You're kind of talking to the AI, and you can ask it for things. You can say. Can you summarize this email? Can you write me a first draft of an email? Can you analyze this legal contract? Uh, There are a ton of just applications on a day-to-day basis where AI can serve as a first draft tool or a first pass at analysis, something like that. Uh, And we can get into this more, but I kind of like to think of AI as a co-pilot where it's kind of sitting on your desk at all times and you can use it to help you solve problems and, and help reduce some of those menial or repetitive tasks. And then an autonomous agent, which can really provide some proprietary benefit in um, automating some more sophisticated tasks in your organization. Well, Ross, let me ask a question here because when you say, when you use the term AI or anybody does, I think of that as an umbrella term, 
Yeah. AI is this umbrella term. Underneath that are a zillion different things. I mean, is Alexa AI? Is you know my you know Google Assistant? You know, I ask it to do things all the time. That's AI. So you have that umbrella underneath that, and ChatGPT is underneath the AI umbrella, correct? So that is a great point. Uh, essentially, if we were to define AI, and it is incredibly broad, it's kind of the goal of giving machines the ability to complete tasks that would normally require human level intelligence. So that's huge, right? That includes yeah. robotics and computer vision and, and a whole bunch of stuff. You know, you're... dynamics with the robots. We all <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But that has, or I guess I should say the field of AI has been around ever since computers first started being developed in the 40s, you know, big in the 50s. So it's been around a long time. So what, why are things different right now? What's the difference? In the last, ever since about 2017, when Google created this architecture called the Transformer, um, there has been this shift towards what's called generative AI. And generative AI is the ability to create human-like content. So that can be audio, that can be video, uh, that can be images, that can be text. So ChatGPT is a specific subsection of generative AI even that's called large language models. And a large language model gives us the ability to deal with language. And a, a surprising emergent behavior from that is the ability to reason and to have logic and to do a lot of things that we we otherwise considered only in the realm of human capabilities. But now these language models can start to act as a logic layer in our organizations and start to help us interpret that data layer that we've all had, but have only been able to interpret it, interpret it with humans or um, machine learning. But now we have easy access to it. So well, that's incredible. And I want to I want to bring up a scenario where I've used chat GPT and get your comment on it and then how other companies like the ones that Tane is working with, the different industries would use it. But, you know, I, I have a law firm I'm involved with and I build out. And uh, prior to chat GPT, it was recording videos with the attorneys, right? Do a ton of video on legal concepts, you know, and, and some of it fairly sophisticated. And then I'd go have to write or the team would write, have to write a, a content around that. And that was a painstaking process, right? Because you had to go out, write it, make sure it wasn't plagiarism, piece it together because the attorneys weren't writing it. They shoot the video and just go figure out the content. Chat GPT comes around. Now shoot the video. And I know, Tane, we talked about this because you, you know, you can use this for the video content, which is awesome that you're doing is I go and I tell Chat GPT, we just did, uh, you know, this legal video on uh, a multi-purpose limited liability company. Write me a short article on it. Why is that important for property owners? Boom, second, spits it out, run it through anti-plagiarism filters. It does pass, run it by the senior managing partners. They sign off on the legalities of it. Boom, within seconds, I got content to go along with the video. It's been game changer for me and for you know chairs and tonic for that purpose. What is your comment about that? And then what are other companies, what are they looking to use it for? Yeah, I mean... This is generative AI, right? And so like you're pointing out here, it's incredibly good at creating content and generating content. So it can be applied as a first draft tool for a lot of those um, you know, processes and procedures, onboarding materials can be used for legal documents, can be used for uh, blog posts, website content, social media posts, product descriptions, technical specifications, anything that is in text format it can likely assist you in a first draft. Now, we do want to talk about some of the technical limitations. Uh, I do advise that humans review the output of AI just to ensure that it's applicable, that it's relevant, that it's accurate. Uh, but it's so much easier to review something and to edit something than it is to create it for the first time, right? That's so a good to, point. Yeah. yeah. So there's massive efficiency improvements in that way. So if you look at it in terms of content generation, that is certainly incredibly applicable, but you can also use it in terms of understanding and improving um, the rate at which we can learn things. So you take a news article or an industry news article, learn about something that's going on, summarize that for me, or you know this person's email, summarize, extract the action item. So I don't have to be, I don't have to read this massive verbose long-winded email. I think we've all had some of those. 
Uh, and then you can also use this technology in the logic layer of your company. You can use it to categorize, uh, let's say, customer tickets, for instance. So it could say that, or emails, it could say, this person is angry, this person's confused, this person is pleased, and then send it to the necessary support technician to handle that or put it in the necessary inbox. Interesting. You can use it for pattern recognition. So you could send in all of uh, your customer support tickets and say, why are people unsubscribing? Why are people not purchasing? Uh, what do people have the most challenges with, with our product or service? And do some of that analysis as well. And then it can code as well. So it can plug into your SQL database and it can query for information that normally you would have had to have a, a dedicated SQL person write the queries for you and they're backed up. But now anyone has access in natural language to your company's data. It's I could go on and on about applications, but it's, it's incredible, honestly. Well, Ross, a question I had is uh, for the content piece of it, when it goes out and writes an article, where is it finding that information? I mean, is it looking at all these different sources and extrapolating or creating it from scratch or what, what's going on there actually? Really good question. So this goes back into the way that these language models are trained or at least the way they're trained today. You take a snapshot of the internet. So in the case of ChatGPT, that's from September, 2021. And you feed it into the model and then you ask the model to find patterns of words that appear in sequences. So you ask it to find which word is most likely to come next after whatever I've started this document with or whatever I've started this question with. And so then it will be able to recognize as a statistical probability machine, if I start writing uh, a statement of work, what is most likely gonna come next based on what I know about the instructions you gave, which kind of company you have. And so, it is in a sense, it's kind of yes to both of your questions. In one sense, it's writing something from scratch uh, in the sense that it's the document that it creates likely doesn't exist anywhere else. Okay, okay. But at the same time, it's also using the patterns that it found in its training data. So that's the internet, most of the internet. It's using the patterns that it found to create this document. Now, the technology is called what is what's called non-deterministic, which means you could ask the same question multiple times and get different answers. Oh, okay. now, that doesn't mean that you're going to get fundamentally different answers. It'll be the same basic gist, but it'll use different words. There's an element of randomness in how it goes about constructing it. Uh, and then I do just want to put in a word of caution here. There is a possible for what's called a hallucination, and we can get into what that is and how you kind of mitigate that risk and guard against that. But you do tend to want humans to review content generation. Yeah, I mean, because a hallucination could be a plagiarism related thing where it grabbed something already written somewhere else type of thing. It's possible. Um, in some cases, or and I'll say in most cases, it's where you ask a question about something that it may not know the answer, but it kind of wants to give you an answer. Um, there was a, a recent, you know, as, as something that came out in the news, essentially, there was a lawyer uh, in, in New York who's been 25 plus years in law, so he knows what he's doing. And I don't know if you've heard about this, but he was suing a, a Colombian airline, I think called Avianca. And as, as part of that, he went to ChatGPT and he asked, you know, can you give me some cases that are, would help me in my suit? And ChatGPT said, yeah, of course, here's a list of airlines, a list of cases involving airlines. But there was only one problem with the cases, and that's that they were completely made up. So, oh. <laughs> you know, that's a big problem, right? But they looked incredibly real because they had the names of uh, airlines in them. They had uh, the appellate court. They had uh, the circuit. They had the case number and the date. So to a trained lawyer of 25 plus years, it looked incredibly real. Yeah. So now OpenAI is getting much better at stopping hallucinations and guarding against them. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. And and so you can use the version four model, which is the the paid version, and that seems to be a bit better at preventing hallucinations. But at the same time, you tend to want a human to uh, verify the output. And I'll just say one last thing. You can also use a browser-based model to first search the internet, get accurate information, and then have the AI use that information in the answer. Oh, wonderful. Uh, love it. Yeah. And, and Ross, we're not mentioned um, AI brains. You set companies up for AI brains or get the... What does that mean? 
Yeah. So imagine, you know, when we go to ask ChatGPT a question, it's helpful. It can help us problem solve and, and brainstorm. But one of the challenges is, and one of the things that companies ask me all the time is, well, how do I get it to know things about my company? Uh, I want it so that it knows uh, my processes and procedures or my technical manuals and documents or my inventory. To do that, you have to essentially train the model on your company's data and give it secure access to your data in a way where there are permissions set up properly so not everybody can access everything, obviously. But in that way, you can have one interface, sort of a ChatGPT-like interface, that you can ask questions of it, and it will go to your data and pull the relevant information and return that to you. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. And Kane, what do you, what do you make of this with the uh, businesses you're involved with? Like what, what industries are your members in that this pertains to? I mean, it's, it's all of them, honestly, because what I'm seeing is that, you know, and Ross kind of s- talked a little bit about this as well, but there are kind of two areas that are maybe easier entry areas. And that is marketing and HR, you know, have chat GPT, write a job description, you know, give, give them some, you know, some particular, some framework, maybe the size of the company and a few other, you know, um, um, inputs. And it will it will give you a rough draft for a job description, and same thing with as Mark as uh, Ross was mentioning, you know, marketing blog posts and strategies. And I even um, I'm working with a client on doing a restructure of their organization, and I've asked G- ChatGPT to help me with that. I again, you you give them some key inputs, and then you look at what they come out with, and you're like, oh, got to tweak those inputs a little bit, but. It, it can be used for a lot of that, um, you know, you know, rough drafts on anything. The the, the other thing that um, I just want to mention, and and Ross talked a lot about this when he came to my group, is we really have to shift our mindset around this technology, and and I'll let I'll kick it back off to to Ross because um, this isn't just a new a new cool tool. It is a new cool tool, but it is. It is tectonic plate shifting tool, you know? So we all need to be aware of it and aware of it both in, 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 you know, there's some bad actors out there for sure. So we have to be aware of what people can do with it. Um, but we also have to use its power and its, its, um, its significance. And so, so Ross, I mean, you, you talk a lot about um, making it a habit. Yeah. I'd love for you, you know, how would you recommend to, to our, you know, our viewers, how to make this a habit in your life? Well, I think that's a great point because I, I live and breathe this stuff all day long. Right. But even then I sometimes find myself doing something manually. I'll be like, I'm going to write this out or try to solve this problem on my own without referencing anything when it should be, you know, at first I'm going to go to the AI to help me write a draft or to help me think through this problem. And so really when we can use the AI as what it truly is, a digital assistant, it can start to augment augment your capabilities and it, it can help you do things that you couldn't otherwise do. So it's not even it's delegation for sure, but it's also augmentation. So how do you actually make it a habit, right? It just like, well, first of all, what I would probably do is go to ChatGPT or, or whatever language model you're using and say, what are some frameworks for adopting new habits? Like, how could I do this? And then <laughs> let's put together a framework for adopting AI as a habit. And we can start having that conversation. And, and that's the kind of frame of mind you want to be in. When you have a question about doing something, I think a lot of us over the last 20 years, you know, we've been trained that we go to Google when we want answers to knowledge, right? We we want to look up someone's age. We want to look up the process for this or that. Great. We'll go to Google. We'll look that up. But whenever we have a problem, we're like, okay, well, we know Google's not going to be able to solve that exactly. We're going to have to solve that problem and think through it. But now the new thought process is whenever I have a problem, I can now go to AI to help me think more clearly. It's almost a search engine that allows us to solve problems in a, in a truly... Um, dynamic way. So how do you get started with that? You know, ask for your favorite habit forming paradigms and and principles. And then also I would say, pick one task that you're going to do with AI. And for a week or two weeks, just do that one task, whether that's 
summarizing an email, or that's drafting an email, or that's learning about new things, uh, summarizing content, or just asking questions. But get that one thing you're going to do, and then continually do it so you get in the habit of coming back to it over and over. That's a great point, getting in the habit. It's got me thinking about that too. Uh, yeah, because I got the chat GPT saved uh, you know, on my toolbar there, and you click on it, you're constantly working with it throughout the day. Uh, yeah, and, that habit thing, yeah, good reminder, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Paul, as part of my CEO peer group, I meet with each one of my CEOs once a month for a, for a one-to-one conversation. And after Ross was there and we talked about ChatGPT, every single one of those uh, one-to-one conversations included a little bit about ChatGPT. Mm-hmm. And whether it was just a new awareness or somebody had a funny thing that they wanted to uh, write an email to their husband about something and they didn't know how to position it. So they said, how do I do that? So it wrote an email to their husband about an uncomfortable issue. So it, it's- I'm leaving you. <laughs> Exactly. Well, no, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. But, you know, you never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah. Your point is well taken. I know, Tani, you being at Vistage, Vistage is great because they're all over this issue. And I know there's a lot of, uh, you know, content going out. I think, Ross, you're you're in the speaking to Vistage around the country. So they're bringing in experts like Ross. You're on it. And it's I think it's why the businesses, Tani, that you work with have an edge being in Vistage and working with you over other businesses because of, of things like this, you know, this issues out AI and you're just diving into it. Yeah, it was interesting. I saw a chart. I think I shared this with you, Ross. I might have emailed this to you, but yeah. a chart by country of adoption rate. And um, the U.S. was way down at the bottom, but a westernized country were much slower to adapt Huh. And yeah, Ross and I kind of talked a little bit about it. Ross, do you, do you have any insight on why that might be? So I think we have a strong um, story culture of concern around AI. And then that's not necessarily new. It's, you know, even Frankenstein in a way is a concern of the machine kind of rising up, right? And Terminator. And, and these stories are in our well, you know, public awareness and consciousness. And so when we think of AI and we don't necessarily understand truly how it works or what it does, there the first reaction can be like, mm, kind of kind of afraid of that. I, I I know that I that doesn't turn out well. You get some Skynet situations. But I think when you actually open up a little bit, learn about it and say, okay, how does this technology actually work? What's going on underneath? Um, you find out that we don't my position at least is that we don't necessarily have to be afraid of the AI itself, but Mm. more, I think we need to be concerned with humans using the AI for malicious purposes. So that, you know, that's a separate conversation and we as a society certainly need to uh, address that. But when you learn more about the AI, I think you become more comfortable with it. Well said, Ross. Well said. Well, we could talk about this forever. This is a great topic. I want to tell people listening that wherever you're watching this up here, down there is going to be information on how to get connected to Tane and Ross. They're great people to follow for many different reasons. Uh, and and, and uh, love to have both of you back and to track this going forward. And thanks everybody for being here. Ross, Tane, thank you. Thank you thanks, all so much. Paul. Great to be here. Appreciate it. All right.